Hey friends, Todd here, doing a little prophetic pondering about the craziness of the days in which we live and the nearness of the return of Christ for the rapture of the church. And my friends, my friends, my friends, it is uh, getting nearer all, all the time. Uh, as I've talked about before, you know, I've been watching for the return of Christ for the rapture uh, for many years, um, decades. And it used to be that there would be something significant happen in the news and you would kind of, you, you would be able to discuss that in a prophetic sense. What is all the dust flying around in my room? <laughs> what in the world? I gotta, I need, apparently I need to dust my office. <laughs> but as I was saying, you know, there's like, um, you know, the days we live in now are very different than those days. And those days when I, I'm not talking about like decades ago, I'm talking about like a couple of years ago. We're at the point now where things are happening um, at such a pace that it is very, very clear that when Jesus referred to end time signs as birth pains, and, and by that we would know that the, he means like that they would increase in frequency and intensity. We are in those days because now it's, 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 um, there's so much that you have to not talk about just from the standpoint of you don't have the time. Um, just keeping up with it. Uh, I, I invest a lot of time in, in watching and in keeping up on this stuff. And, and I, I fall woefully short of being able to stay on top of it all. But I do think there's some significant things, um, even still on the horizon, on the very near horizon. And we're going to talk about that today. But before we do that, um, I want to give you the gospel. My prayer uh, that, I, that I just prayed and that I pray before each video is that, and that over each video is that someone that doesn't know Jesus as their savior, that have not placed their trust and their faith in him for the forgiveness of their sins, that they would have somehow stumbled upon a video that I've done and would come into contact with the good news. And that's what the gospel is. It's just a word that means good news. And there is good news, friends, because of the bad news. Uh, that which that is what uh, the bad news it's what makes the good news good and it what and it's also what makes it essential and necessary so the bad news is that you and i have a sin problem as i talked about i believe in my last video i'm not talking about a problem of sinning i'm talking about a problem of sin sin is is more uh, sin in terms of, or, or sin versus sins, plural, that we commit is much like comparing symptoms to the disease, right? If you've got cancer or you've got some sort of horrible disease, you don't need a treatment for the symptoms, my friends. You need a treatment for the disease that is manifesting the symptoms. The sins that you and I commit, um, those are just symptoms of the bigger problem, which is a separation from God. And so it's not a matter of behavior modification. It's a matter of dealing with the, the underlying problem that is the cancer in our soul. And that is what sin is. And it separates us from the God who made us and the God who loves us enough that he was willing to come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, become a man, live the perfect sinless life that you and I cannot live so that he would then be a fitting sacrifice to satisfy God's anger and wrath against sin. And I know that sounds like a lot. And if you're new to this and haven't heard that before, I'm just going to walk through it a tiny bit slower here. Um, the gospel and scripture in the Bible is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 2 through 4 say this, This is the gospel by which you are saved, that Christ died on the cross for your sins according to scripture and was buried and raised to life again on the third day, according to scripture. Those two key aspects of, 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 the, of Jesus Christ and who he was and what he did, the work that he accomplished on your behalf, that is critical. That is, that is the heart of the gospel. And, and it was prophesied. So, so when, when that scripture says, according to scripture, two times, it's pointing out to the audience of that day that, like, you know your Old Testament. You know the prophecies about Messiah, and he has fulfilled them. And so we, we know and can trust that the, fulfill, the fulfillment of future prophecies about Christ and his return can be just as assured because Christ satisfied all of the prophecies that were, that were given about him um, when he came the first time. So 
What's the big deal about that? The big deal is, again, you and I have a sin problem. Christ's death on, on the cross satisfied the payment that sin demanded. What is that? That leads us to, to how we appropriate the salvation that Jesus offers for ourselves. And that is found in what's called the ABCs of salvation. Um, I, I learned this decades ago when I was a young life leader. And it, it, it is simply the A being admit, the B being believe, and the C being confess. And there, there is scripture um, to back up each of those points. The A is admit that you're a sinner. This is like saying, you know, I recognize that I have a sin problem. Um, you know, if, to use the cancer analogy, um, how, do, how can you receive the treatment for cancer if you are in denial that you have it, right? You won't seek it out. So admission that you have a problem is critical in seeking out the problem. And the Bible says in Romans 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that is what sin is. It's falling short of, when it says God's glory, it means his standard, his, his standard of righteousness. And you and I are included in the word all. So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23 starts to talk about what that means for us. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and I think there's a temptation to kind of jump to that, the gift of God, without really recognizing what the wages of sin are. And, and again, let, let's look at this contrast here. The, this, this verse contrasts the, the wages of sin. And now a wage is what you earn for what you do, right? You earn a wage for your work, for example. Um, a gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A gift is what you're given and you're offered. So all that is really left is for you to receive and accept that gift and make it your own. If I give you a gift for a birthday or for Christmas and, and you receive that gift, but you, you, like, you, you take it, but you never open it, you really have you re really received the gift. Get, get, getting to the point where you can receive that gift, that happens by the B, which is believe. You believe that Jesus was who he said he was. And make no mistake, Jesus did not paint himself as just a good moral teacher. He did not paint himself as one of many roads to heaven. Jesus was very exclusive in his claim that he was the son of God and that he was the only way to the father. In uh, the book of John, John 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the father but through me. We're told that there is only one name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. It is only by Jesus that our broken relationship with God is destroyed. And again, because the wages of sin is death, it is critical that you and I have a repaired and restored relationship with God through Christ. Or else you enter eternity and you have to pay for your sins instead of relying on the, the perfect and finished work of Christ on the cross, as the payment for your sins, you have to now pay for that yourself. And again, the wage that you earn from that is death. And at that point, when you're in eternity, that death is no longer just the physical death of your body, but it is the spiritual death, the permanent separation from God in a place called hell. Hell is not a popular thing to talk about, but the Bible talks about it a lot. And um, I can only tell you that it's a real place and you don't want to be there. And so if you can get to the place where you believe that Jesus is who he said he was and that he is the only way to heaven, the only way to a restored relationship with God, then the C in the ABCs is just to confess that, to confess it. And, and why that's important is Romans 10, 9 through 10 say this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so you're, you, you being saved comes by the confession of your mouth that, that flows out of the belief in your heart. So, and it's just confessing that to God. You don't, doesn't mean you have to go up and stand in front of a church or a group of people and make this proclamation. It's, it's primarily to God. But you should also not be ashamed of that and, and not be unwilling to confess it before man because Jesus makes some claims about that, that, you know, if you, uh, if you are ashamed to confess me before men, I will be ashamed to confess you before my father. So, um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to not be ashamed of that, but it's really, it's just a, a matter of confessing it with your mouth to God that you believe these things about Jesus. 
And that is what saves you, friends. Um, belief in Christ. John 3, 16, the most well-known verse in all of Scripture, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So that belief is the key that unlocks the door to salvation and your eternity, secured eternity, in the presence of God. The blood of Jesus is, is a finished and completed work that covers your sin, past, present, and future. People want to um, act like that you, you suddenly, when you become a believer, that you you suddenly stop sinning. That is just unbiblical. There's, there's passages that speak to this. Um, we still struggle. We wrestle against, um, against our own fleshly nature. Um, and, and thankfully, we have forgiveness when we fall short. But, but we still struggle. We still wrestle. And man, I know in these days um, that we are living in, spiritual warfare is just off the chain. And I see it in, in groups that I talk, uh, that I'm a part of, um, from other believers, struggling with all manner of, um, of temptations, of just falling and falling short of, of doing what they want to do and, and avoiding the things they don't want to do. And, um, and there's always all kinds of ways that spiritual warfare manifests. And I'm going to probably, I'm, you know, that's in, on my, my list of things to do a video about at some point, but um, because I just see it over and over and over again, it's a theme that I see repeated in the comment section of my own videos. And I see in the groups that I'm a part of and just in my conversations with people. Um, spiritual warfare is is off the chart. And so let's be lifting each other up in prayer for that. And I, I covet your prayers for me and my family in that regard as well. So um, I want to... I want to talk about something specific, but I do want to circle back around to something to correct something that I that I misspoke in my last video. Several people pointed it out in the comments section, and rather than I continue to have to um, go back and say, "Yeah, I misspoke," um, I, I said I said this. I said that once the rapture happens, uh, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was a, a, to the effect that once the rapture happens, those that are left will end up in hell. And that's not an accurate statement. Um, my, my, my mouth kind of got ahead of my brain in that moment. And what I, what I was thinking was, after the rapture, the, the, it is going to be far harder to come to faith in Christ for, for multiple reasons that I won't get into here. But we're, we're told that, the, that God himself sends a strong delusion among the people that are left on the earth so that they will believe the lie of the Antichrist. And so... We don't know exactly what that lie is going to be. Many have speculated. I leave it as I don't know. Um, I know I'm not going to be here to have to worry about it, so I'm thankful for that. But I do know that I think it will be insanely hard. And at some point, three and a half years into the tribulation period, it's, it's going to cost you your life to follow Christ. And if you're not willing to live for him now, will you be willing to die for him then? Um, I don't know. I, I think it's going to be much harder. That's why I think, um, you know, a reading of Revelation, I think if, if people that place Revelation chapter 7, for example, at like the midpoint of the tribulation, which which I don't believe a literal reading of the scripture speaks to, but the, 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 I, people, I think, believe that there's going to be this great, um, that the multitude that no one could count are tribulation saints. And I don't believe that's what the scripture leads us to. I, I My personal opinion, and this is just what I have, have gathered from reading over Revelation many, many times, is there's not a lot. Um, the, 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 you got to understand that the the protection that's afforded uh, during the, the second three and a half years of the tribulation is for the Jewish people. So unless you're a Jew living in Israel at that time, um, I, I don't see that that's extended to, to other believers in other parts of the world. Um, the tribulation is, it's, it's called, in, in scripture, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is, is the original name of Israel. And so it is a time that is focused on Israel to bring about their ultimate final salvation through their faith in Christ. So it's not that people won't get saved. It's just, it's, it's going to be much, much harder. And I, I, sadly, I, I believe that the fate of most in the tribulation will be hell. That will be the eternal destiny of many, if not most. And so I just think it's going to be harder. So that's kind of when I when I said that in the last video, that's what I was thinking. It just kind of got smashed down and, and came out wrong. So apologies for any confusion on that. 
So that said, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about the blood moon that's coming up this week. Um, many of you know about this. Most probably do if you're watching videos like this. Uh, but there are some interesting things that I think make this blood moon uh, one to watch and one worth watching. And so we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the blood moon. We're going to talk about blood moons in connection to the day of the Lord. We're going to deal with like uh, what what I believe is it's it's been a, a I think it's a problematic passage, and, and I think um, it can really cause some confusion and see and be seemingly a contradiction. So we're going to deal with that. Um, so I have my tea ready and filled up and we're ready to go. So we're going to start off just with the, the, the facts of this blood moon. Um, Thursday and Friday, November 18th through the 19th, um, you may want to plan a lunar eclipse party and watch for uh, the full frost moon to turn red. It's a partial eclipse visible here and throughout North America. It's going to be a, an impressive event lasting three hours and 28 minutes. That will make us the longest lunar eclipse of the 21st century. Um, so really interesting that um, th through 20, the, the year 2100, it's the longest duration of a solar eclipse that we have. Um, and in practical terms, it's almost a total eclipse. Usually light from the sun paints the face of the moon a grayish white, but when the, when the eclipse peaks around 1 a.m. Pacific time on the 19th, our planet will block 98% of the sun's light from reaching the moon's surface, washing it in a reddish hue. So um, it says here, uh, the next, let me hold on. Let me make sure I'm not missing something here. Um, So it says the next lunar eclipse will, will occur May 16th, 2022, when a 100% reddish blood moon will be visible in North America for 84 minutes, and it's a total lunar eclipse. Now, I find this interesting, and this will have some bearing, I think, on, potentially, um, could have some prophetic bearing on, on what we're looking at here. However, this eclipse season is not done yet because the partial lunar eclipse will be followed on the next new moon on Saturday, December 4th, 2021, with that most dramatic kind of eclipse of all, a total solar eclipse. It will be visible only to a few thousand eclipse chasers, mostly on cruise ships in Antarctica. But nonetheless, here within one, one cycle, uh, within a month, you have literally the moon turning blood red and the sun being darkened in a solar eclipse. So the the thing to, to, that I think is really significant here is that the, the United States and Central America, most of uh, South America, will be able to view the um, this, this lunar eclipse in totality um, for the entire three hours and 28 minutes. So... I want to talk about the three hours and 28 minutes thing, because uh, as I, I heard on another video, I found this really interesting, and this did not immediately spring to mind, that the, the tribulation period, the time of God pouring out judgment upon those that are left on the earth after the rapture, is, is known as a seven-year period, but the Bible makes clear distinction that it is divided into two three-and-a-half-year periods. It refers to those in terms of 42 months, uh, 2,520 days, or, or I'm sorry, 1,260 days. 2,520 would be like the full seven years. Uh, 1,260 days, or um, picking up on reference from the book of Daniel, uh, for time, times, and half a time. The time being one year, the times being two years, and half a year being, or half a time being half a year. So a total of three and a half years. So the fact that this is three and a half hours, um, essentially, is pretty pretty interesting. Now, again, I, I don't. How significant is this? Is it? I don't know. I don't know. I think it. I think it. It could potentially be, and and I and I think we'll look at some scripture as to how um, the idea of the sun going dark and even even to blood in, in a couple of places and the moon turning or the, the moon turning dark or even to blood and the sun going dark um, are 
are connected with the day of the Lord, which, which is the tribulation period. It's the seven-year judgment of the earth. It's Daniel's 70th week. So, but what I found interesting is the three hours, 28 minutes, and I thought, well, that's a little less obvious, I guess, than if it were three hours and 30 minutes. That would be like slap you in your face, right? That would be slap you in your face obvious that... Um, that, that there's a parallel here maybe between three and a half hours and are, is, is that signaling the beginning of the first three and a half years? Again, possibly, but, but I, I did make note that, okay, well, it's not, it doesn't say three hours, 30 minutes. It says three hours, 28 minutes. And I thought, well, would there be some significance to that? And so I looked up 328 and Strong's Greek Concordance. And again, maybe nothing, but maybe. I find it interesting, and so I thought I'd share it. That means, that's a word that is anadzononomi. Uh, anadzononomi. Anadzononomi. <laughs> I, don't, I don't speak Greek, friends, so <laughs> that's the best I got um, from the phonetic spelling here in the Strong's Concordance. Um, and it means to gird up. And the usage is I gird up, brace up, um, a metaphor from the girding of the flowing tunic to prevent its hamper hampering one in active work. <laughs> Um, the, um, the helps word study here is pretty interesting. Um, it's to, uh, to gird or to take out slack properly to raise a tunic or tighten the belt, uh, girding oneself figuratively, getting ready or prepared to move quickly. Kind of juicy there, isn't it? Um, i.e. where someone needs to go and arrive at without delay. Pretty cool. Only used one time in the New Testament, this word. This word is used in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. I'm going to read this out of the NIV that's on Bible Hub. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to go, back and, and go back around to it in a different place. Um, now, you know what? No, I'm not. I'm going to read it out of my NIV study Bible because um, I think it's a better translation than the NIV that's referenced here on... Um, and, and Bible Hub, and, and on the, your online sources. <clears throat> uh, so, 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action, which is this, this phrase uh, of gird up, of being prepared. Prepare your mind for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's pretty cool. So, we, we've got a reference in this 328 to girding up, preparing ourselves to move quickly from one place to another. And, um, and then its usage connected to the, the revealing of the revelation of Jesus Christ at his coming. Pretty cool. Um, and I, and I'll just give you the study note here from the NIV, the NIV study Bible. It says, um, prepare for action. The first of a long series of exhortations, actually imperatives, that end at um, chapter 5, verse 11. This one is a graphic call for action. In the language of the first century, it meant that the reader should literally gather up his long flowing garments and be ready for physical action. And then it says, um, uh, the grace given you when Christ Jesus is revealed, it says, the final state of complete blessedness and deliverance from sin. And, and, and we know when that is. When is our our ultimate and final deliverance from sin is, is when we're taken to heaven and removed out of this sinful world. So I don't know. I find that pretty, pretty cool. Um, so I, I want to look at the place where for me, uh, the reference to the moon turning to blood is most significant. Now it, and I'm going to talk about the other places where it shows up. But as I've talked about before, in my view of Revelation 6 and the opening of the seals, um, I think that uh, Revelation 6.12 is, is the most significant place. And, and this will kind of lead us into a bit of, of what I feel like could be a contradiction if, in terms of our understanding. So uh, the opening of the sixth seal, it says... Um, when I saw the lamb open the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black like sackcloth made of goat hair, goat hair, and the whole moon 
turned blood red. And actually, I'm just going to read the rest of the rest of that um, a little passage. And the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs um, drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So keep all of those things in your mind, because they will come up again. So, um, so again, the whole, uh, the sky turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. So here you've got the sky, there's the sun black, the moon to blood. Those are the two things. The stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. So you've got the stars falling to earth. You've got a reference to the fig tree and, um, and the, and the figs falling after being shaken. So again, very, very much the like onset of the day of the Lord of judgment kind of, kind of language. And you've got the sky receding like a scroll and you've got mountains and islands being removed from their place. And again, at the end of this passage about the sixth seal, the people of the earth say, um, hide us from the faith. They're hiding in the mountains and the rocks and, and asking the rocks and mountains to fall on them. And it says, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand. So again, this is what I think, you know, and, I, and I've referenced the, the book Re uh, Earthquake Resurrection before by David W. Lowe. Highly recommend that. Um, but but I think, so, so here's the question. Is this a literal blood moon? I, I think that's the first question that we deal with. Um, the, 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 the moon that's here is, I, I see it as being one of three possibilities, okay? It's either a naturally occurring blood moon like we're going to have on Friday, um, where, you know, it's, it's the, the light from the sun bending around the, uh, the earth and casting a, a reddish hue on the, on, on the moon. Um, it's that kind of blood moon. Or it's a supernatural movement of God to, to, to bring that about. And, and I think in the, in the naturally occurring, um, well, okay, so it's either naturally occurring or it's supernaturally changed or it's a result of the events of the sixth seal. If you look at the sixth seal, I mean, you've got um, mountains and islands removed from its place. Um, so there's like this massive earthquake. Um, it says, you know, right out of, out of the gate in verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. And, and the, the convulsions of the earth um, or contractions of the earth, <laughs> I like that idea better, um, is, is moving every mountain and island from its place. So you've got global cataclysm happening. So it, it, is, it is possible that all of the events that go into, into that, that, that are happening on the earth at this time, might cause the moon to turn the sun to turn dark, the moon moon to blood. Um, I, I know like a year or so ago, I saw some pretty remarkable uh, photographs out of California and neighboring states that were um, were places where the whole sky was blood red because of um, the haze and the smoke and everything from the, the wildfires. So I think th those are my three possibilities. Um, and, and I don't, I hold that totally with an open hand. I think it could be I, either any of the three. Um, but if it's, but, but, but the point is, I think a, if, if you are, if you, if you're reading Revelation six and the, um, I'm just going to open the can of worms. If you're placing the beginning of the day of the Lord at the opening of the first seal, th then we have a problem. The problem being with Joel, the book of Joel says this. Um, very, very famous passage. Um, I've got like 30. What in the world? I've got so many tabs open. This information I'm trying to bring out here. Oh, here it is. Okay. Whew, it was the next one over. Um, very well-known passage about the moon turning to blood. And it might be where most people go initially when they think of this. So, It says uh, in Joel chapter two, verse 30, it says, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before 
the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So if, if we're seeing the sun turn to darkness and the moon to blood, which is exactly what we're, we're told here, you know, Revelation 6, 12, the sun turned black like sackcloth made a goat hair, the whole moon turned blood red. Joel 2.30, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. This is the same event. If, if the opening of the sixth seal takes place after the day of the Lord begins at the opening of the first seal, we have a contradiction because Joel says these things happen before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And again, um, in the New Testament, Peter in Acts 2 um, re, re, it quotes this verse. And so, so is it before or is it after? Which leads to another place where I find this. And, and I, I'm personally, again, I, I've solved this one for myself. And I, I'm, you, you believe what you want to believe as you read through the scripture and as you study. Um, but I, that's one of, the, one of the big ones for me is why I think that the, the day of the Lord begins when the people of the earth say that the day of the Lord has come. Um, the great day of their wrath has come. That's the day of the Lord. Um, and I believe that happens at the sixth seal. That's when scripture tells us it happens. That way, <laughs> this, the sun turned to darkness and the moon to blood happens before the great day of the Lord, as Joel says it will. If the day of the Lord happens at the opening of the first seal, by the time we get to the sixth seal, the sun turned to mark darkness and the moon to blood happens after the great day of the Lord has come. So for me, placing the, the, the day of the Lord and the rapture here at the sixth seal uh, the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of believers and, and our rapture being the events that are the catalyst for the earthquake and all of these events. Um, again, very well done and explained in um, the book Earthquake Resurrection. Uh, that satisfies to me, this, this harmonizes that with Joel, being that these things happen before the great day of the Lord. However, then we have the word of the words of Jesus. And, and I think... Um, I think this is where we can get into some uh, some difficulty, and it, this is worth wrestling with because in Matthew twenty four, Jesus says this, and he's answering the questions, and we've talked about this. He's answering three questions. Um, he's answered the, the the disciples ask him. He he mentions that you know the, the the temple is going to be destroyed, and the disciples ask him, well, when will these things happen? Meaning the destruction of the temple. And what will be the signs of your coming? And what will be signs of the end of the age? And again, as we've talked about, that's really significant because the end of the age is the is the age they their their term the end of the age in in the the Jewish mindset of the day meant the age that culminates with the resurrection of the dead, which we now know also means the rapture of the church, right? And so we've looked at that, but Jesus says he he goes in this this in this middle section of his answer where he's talking about. Um, he, he's talking about two things. And, and I think this is, and we'll, we'll have to do another video about this because I've had people ask about this and Jesus is, is giving, prophecy is, um, often has both a, a near and, and far future fulfillment. Okay, there, there can be multiple um, fulfillments. There can be a, a sooner than later uh, fulfillment and then there can be an ultimate fulfillment which is further down the, down the road. And Jesus makes references here in his answer about the temple that are clearly about the the destruction of the temple in 70 AD which his most of his audience at the time would be would, would be around for uh, but but he also has some things in here that are clearly pointing to an ultimate fulfillment in in the tribulation but he after after talking about that he kind of shifts into talking about the second coming but when he does so he throws this this piece in and he says um in verse 26 where he makes this shift it says so if anyone tells you there he is out in the desert do not go out or here he is in the inner rooms do not believe it for as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west so will be the coming of the son of man Wherever there's a carcass, there the vultures will gather. And then he says, immediately after the, after the distress of those days, 
The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And so now, do you see the problem? Do you see like what we need to wrestle with here? What does Jesus mean by immediately after the distress of those days? Now, this is further complicated by the fact that many, many translations are translating this as immediately after the tribulation of those days, okay? So the word there is thalipson or thalipsis, and it means tribulation. However, it's not the only thing it means. Um, and I did not plan on this one, so bear with me here a second. Um, we're just going to, we're just going to pull this word up. Um, the word is thalipson. It's Strong's 2347. And it, the definition <laughs> is tribulation. Um, the usage, however, is persecution, affliction, distress, or tribulation. And so it can be translated depending on how it's used in context and any of those things. The, the problem is, is when we hear tribulation, we think of something very specific. What's happened is to help us understand the, the seven-year period, J time of Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord, whatever word you want to give it, we've kind of kind of boiled that down to the word tribulation. What's happened is we've taken this word, thalipsis, and we've transformed it into a proper noun. It's kind of like capital T, um, capital T tribulation. And then we, we do the same thing with great tribulation to kind of delineate that second year period where things go from like, they really suck to, oh my gosh, they really suck. <laughs> um, and, and so I think you have to understand that that is both tribulation and great tribulation. It, um, as, as we understand those, referring to the seven-year period outlined in Revelation and the events that take place during that time, that is kind of a man-made construct. It's not, it's not something that the Bible doesn't call the, that seven-year period the, the capital T tribulation, if that makes sense. And so, again, th that's problematic in this verse specifically. And, and, and maybe I do a verse of that where we just go through and look at all of the places this word for tribulation is used because it's used, it has, let me scroll down, there's a lot, uh, 45 occurrences in the New Testament, okay? And they are not all talking about the the seven years of, of tribulation that, that, that we think of. And I, again, I, there's nothing wrong with using that word to describe that. It's just that we have to understand that that's not the way the Bible uses that word. Um, Jesus tells us, in this world, you will have trouble. That word trouble is tribulation. It's it's the ellipsis. So, um, again, that that's just, I think, adds to the difficulty here because we see immediately after the tribulation of those days. So we think, okay, the sun turns to darkness and the moon to blood. Um, it must be after the great day of the Lord. Um, so again, which is right? Is is it right that it's after? Or is Joel right when he says before? Is Peter right when in Acts 2 he says before? I'm pretty sure, I'm just going to double check. I know Peter quotes that, and I'm pretty sure he says before. But, you know, um, rather than just go on um, my memory. <laughs> um, nope, let's see. Yep, he Peter Peter includes the before. Uh, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. So, so is it before or is it after? And, and here's what I found helpful. So I, I really dug into this and and really went to great lengths to try to satisfy my own wrestling with this because I come to stuff like this and I can't just, there are some people that goes, eh, well, don't need to worry about that. I do need to worry about that because I, I really care about the word of God and I don't want to misrepresent it. Um, and, and look, I, I, I share my interpretation of things. And if you read and come to a different interpretation, totally fine. Um, I, I, but just, just know that I, my goal here is to, and my prayer, I, I pray to God, Lord, don't let me misrepresent your word. Uh, the word of God is too important, and I, I, the last thing I want to do is misrepresent it in any way. So to me, this is important to figure out what's going on here. And so I combed through 
um, I combed through some commentaries and um, I found them to be really, really helpful. Um, not really, <laughs> but I did find one to be helpful. Um, and and I'm not, re I wasn't really familiar with this one. I've, I've, I've you know, I, I do a lot of reading and commentaries when I'm when I'm studying because I always find it interesting to find what what are people smarter than me? What did that that have studied the Bible longer than me? What did how did they translate these? How did they interpret these things? And I think there's room for that. I don't think we should always just re rely on that. We have to rely on just the, the the Holy Spirit leading and teaching us, right? But I mean, we all go to you know theoretically we all go to church where we hear a sermon preached by a pastor who studied and is giving us his his interpretation of of scripture and its application. So I find it really helpful. And I'd never really looked at pulpit commentary, mainly because in in the headings it 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 falls under original language commentaries. And most of those are are like I have a hard time just because because you know I'm not a, a scholar. Um I'm not a I, I'm not fluent in Greek. I don't know all that all that I should know to really get into that. But what I found with this one is it's really helpful because it does deal with some of the original words and things, but it does so in a way that's still easy to kind of get your head around probably 90 to 95% of it. And again, you, you, I'm not going to probably disagree with or, or agree with everything in the pulpit commentary, but I did find their take on this really helpful. So they're looking at um, uh, the, the term immediately after the tribulation of those days, okay? And it says here, um, the particle must not be disregarded as it implies a caution with respect to the perusia or the appearance of Jesus Christ. The Lord proceeds to announce some details of the final advent, taking the tribulation to be the single fact of the ruin of Jerusalem with its accompanying horrors. Some have explained that the Lord's word immediately after by the foreshortening process of prophecy, which makes the distant future seem close to the obtruding present or by the consideration that, in God's view, time does not exist. One day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. I'm going to pause there for just a second to just explain this idea of the foreshortening of, of prophecy and what, that, what, what they're getting at there. The idea, and I, I, I get that as an artist. So, like, if I were to paint a landscape and I were to paint some trees in the foreground and then a mountain in the background and then another mountain, be, you know, beyond that and another mountain beyond that... Um, what you see as you look at the at the picture is, oh, here's trees and here's a mountain, there's another mountain. But what you don't understand is that in the reality of that of that image, if I'm painting like from a photograph or something, is that there could be hundreds of miles between those two mountains. Um, but you don't see that. You, they're foreshortened as you're looking at the picture kind of all, all at once. That's that's kind of the idea behind that foreshortening of, of prophecy. So picking this back up again. The truth is the tribulation, and this is important, I think, and this 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 is this helps me start to get my, my arms around this. The truth is the tribulation, verse 21, only began with the fall of Jerusalem. That was its first and partial fulfillment. And as St. Luke implies in Luke 21, 30, or 21, 23, and 24, it has been going on ever since and is not yet finished. The punishment of the Jews is still proceeding. Jerusalem is still trodden down by the Gentiles. Wrath still lies upon the people. They are dispersed all over the world. Come back to that. And have been and are more or less persecuted in many countries. The state of things is to continue, quote, till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. It is then immediately after this that the signs announced by the Lord shall be seen. He is, as we said above, purposely indefinite that the church may learn to wait and watch for the return of the Savior and judge. This state of expectation is to be its normal condition. Really helpful stuff in there for me. But the idea that the, the, the tribulation being like beginning with the fall of Jerusalem and continuing on until the present time. Now, you, you might notice that some of the things that are written here um, don't seem to line up with with reality, and that's because, uh, specifically, where he's talking about the Jews, where it says Jerusalem is still trodden down by the Gentiles, um, they are still dispersed all over the world. The, the pulpit commentary, I'm just going to read you about the pulpit commentary and just give you like the background of, of, of this particular commentary. 
the pulpit commentary is a homiletic commentary on the Bible created during the 19th century under the direction of Reverend, Reverend Joseph S. Excel and Henry David Maurice Spence Jones. That's a, like, what, five names on my man. Um, it consists of 23 volumes with 22,000 pages and 95,000 entries and was written over a 30-year period with 100 contributors. So again, these are people that know their Bible, okay? But, but what's interesting is, okay, so they were, uh, this was published like in the late 1800s. So at the time, the Jews were dispersed all over the world, right? Here's what I find really, really cool is if you look at their commentary on Matthew 24, like I, I read the bulk of it um, because I just found this, this part so helpful. I thought, well, maybe they've got some other stuff to share that, that can help shed some light on some of this other stuff. Um, and I read this about Matthew 24, 34. And I know this is like a, a thing that we've talked about a lot about this generation, right? And we just talked about that. Um, I did a, a, a video on the, on, on the fig tree generation. Many people have talked about this. This is kind of one of the key time markers that I talked about in the last video is what, what does, is this generation? And I find this really interesting. Uh, about the uh, Matthew twenty four thirty four, that says, um, "Early I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled." And it says here at the end. And, and again, it it it. I'll just I'll just share this. It gives it gives like some potential. What does this generation mean? And again, we've interpreted it one way specifically, but um, at the time that this was published in the late eighteen hundreds, here's how people were defining that. Obviously, they weren't defining it as the regathering of the nation of Israel because Israel was still dispersed, right? That didn't happen for another 50 years from the time of this publication of this thing. So it says, um, Our Lord's assertion has given rise to skeptical observations as if his prophecy had failed. Alford has endeavored to remove objections by taking the Greek word as equivalent to another Greek word, meaning a race or family of people, and referring it to the continued existence of the Jews. He cites Jeremiah 8, 3, Matthew 12, 45, Matthew 17, 17, Matthew 23, 36, etc., in confirmation of this signification. His examples, however, are not unassailable, though such use is certainly classical. But at the same time, it is unlikely that Christ should thus indefinitely postpone a period of infinite importance to his hearers. But there is no, necessi no necessity for assuming any unusual meaning in the term this generation. Its plain and obvious reference is to the contemporaries of the speaker or those who shall live some 30 or 40 years longer. This period would bring them to the siege of Jerusalem. So again, there's your second potential, what does this generation mean? Um, and again, the preterists, that's, what they would, that's what, how they would answer this. Those who believe that all of prophecy was fulfilled in, in 70 AD, which I think is like demonstrably false. <laughs> like, I won't get into that. But he continues, the commentary continues rather, and remembering that Christ has drawn no definite line between this crisis and the final consummation, we are also justified in regarding all these things as meaning primarily the signs preceding or accompanying the downfall of the city. In a secondary sense, this generation may mean spiritual Israel, the generation of them that seek the Lord. All these things shall surely come to pass, says Chrysostom, and the generation of the faithful shall remain, cut off by none of the things that have been mentioned. For both Jerusalem shall perish, and the more part of the Jews shall be destroyed. But over this generation shall nothing prevail, not famine, nor pestilence, not earthquake, not the tumults of war, nor false Christ, not false prophets, not deceivers, not traitors, not those that cause to offend, nor the false brethren, nor any other such like temptations whatsoever. Then it says this, and I find this really cool. Some critics have combined the three meanings of generation given above and have seen in Christ's words a threefold reference. First, to the contemporary people. Secondly, to the Jewish nation. And thirdly, to the Christian believers or dispensation. Um, I find that really pretty cool that they're giving, 50 years prior to it happening, they're saying that this generation could refer to the Jewish nation which at the time of his publication did not exist. Again, I, I, I find that really cool. So again, I, I think if as we're understanding 
immediately after the tribulation of these days, speaking of like the, the, the tribulation began immediately after the tribulation of these days, referring to the, the destruction of the temple, that these that's when it began and it culminates at the end. To me, that is helpful in rectifying that is this before or after. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so, again, the idea of the, the sun being darkened and the moon turned to blood, or the moon, and sometimes reference is just the moon darkened. Sometimes it's, it's reference to blood, sometimes it's darkened. I want to look at other places where this, where this transpires. We've, we've looked at Acts 2, we've looked at Joel 3. Or 2, sorry, Joel 2. Uh, 2, 30 and 31, I believe. So we want to look at a few of these. Um, and again, these are Old Testament uh, predominantly, Old Testament references that are speaking of the day of the Lord. Often as you're reading and, you, and you're, you're reading in Old Testament, and especially in some of the minor prophets, when you see like uh, phrases like at, in that day, that is a reference to the day of the Lord. That's, that's what that means. And there are, there are prophecies of, of judgment against nations specifically, um, which I think you can look at and see where those things happened historically. There are also passages, again, we have some things that are both a, a near, relatively speaking, and far future fulfillment. And then we have other things where it's clearly looking at um, like the judgment of all nations, for example. Um, that's not happened yet, but we know that that does happen at the time of the end. So we're just going to look at a few of these. We're going to look at um, Joel 3, 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened. The stars will no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. If that doesn't sound like the onset of the day of the Lord and the ultimate protection of the Jewish people in that latter half, um, that's, that's clearly what's in view here. But again, we've got the sun and the moon being darkened, the stars no longer shine, um, the heavens and the earth trembling. So those events of the sixth seal showing up there as well. Um, uh, Isaiah 13. Uh, this is a prophecy against Babylon, but again, just notice the connection of judgment with these things. It says, see, in verse, uh, Isaiah 13, verse 9, see the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its, for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and I will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make people scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. Again, Revelation at the end of Revelation 6, it's like, save us from the wrath of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? And, and again, we have at the end of this, I will make the heavens tremble, the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty and the day of his burning anger. And again, we've got the sun and the moon referenced here as, as clear indicators of judgment of God. Isaiah 24, uh, verse 21. In that day, again, in that day, referencing the day of the Lord, the Lord will punish the powers in the heaven above and the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be dismayed, the sun ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders with great glory. So again, the sun and the moon referenced to um, the day of the Lord. Isaiah 34 uh, again, as, as I talked about, judgment against the nations. It's kind of the, uh, the man-made subheading here. Uh, starting in verse 1. Come near, you nations, and listen. Pay attention, you peoples. Let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all that comes out of it. The Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is on all their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will stink the mountains will be soaked with their blood. 
all the stars in the sky will be dissolved and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Again, Revelation 6.12, friends. <laughs> uh, the whole moon turned blood red. The stars in the sky fell to the earth. At, as late figs dropped from a fig tree, when shaken by a strong wind, the sky receded like a scroll rolling up. What Isaiah 34 is prophesying is happening in Revelation 6.12. So, it's day of the Lord. Ezekiel 32. <clears throat> Whew. A lot of talking without tea. And we'll just pick up here in verse 7. Actually, no, I'm going to back up a little bit. <laughs> because here's the thing. What this tells us, like, this is prophecy, friends. And this is sure. This is sure stuff that's going to happen. And if you are outside of a relationship with Christ, this should give you the chills. Because this is surely going to happen. And that's why you need Jesus. And you need him today. Because we don't know when this is going to go down. Um, but, but listen to, I mean, tell me this is, not, if, this is terrifying language here. Ezekiel 32. We'll start in verse 3. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. With a great throng of people, I will cast my net over you, and they will haul you up in my net. I will throw you on the land and hurl you on the open field. I will let all the birds of the sky settle on you, and all the animals of the wild gorge themselves on you. I will spread your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your remains. I will drench the land with your flowing blood all the way to the mountains, and the ravines will be filled with your flesh. When I snuff you out, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you. I will bring darkness over your land. Again, a connection with the sun and the moon being darkened with the judgment of God being poured out on the earth. Again, um, Joel 2, verse 10. This is actually interesting. It's, it's talking about an army of locusts, and we know over the last few years the locust issues, and I've, I've, I've referenced that in some videos before. But it's talking about this army of locusts that's coming. And it says, They storm the city, they run along the wall, they climb into houses, entering through windows like thieves. Before them, the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. So again, the sun and the moon turning dark, connected there to a naturally occurring thing with, with the locusts. So multiple ways this could play out. But again, the, the, the point being that there's a connection to judgment and the sun and the moon turning dark. Amos 8, again, uh, verse 9. says, In that day, declares the Sovereign Lord, again, like the day of the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious festivals into mourning, all your singing into weeping. I will make you all wear, I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son at the end of a, like a bitter day. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord. Well, I will send a famine throughout the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to the east, searching for the Lord, word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Again, pointing to future, pointing to the future uh, and, and uh, a future judgment. What's interesting here and why I put this in here is aside from, you know, the sun going down at noon and, and the darkening the earth in broad daylight, obviously a connection to the sun turning dark, is this, this idea, and again, why I think that there's not going to be a, just this great multitude of people coming out of the tribulation because there will be a famine for the word of the Lord. The idea, you know, I pray that that there are resources on YouTube and online, and but we know that the internet is being purged of things that don't support narratives that are publicly approved. How much more so in a time of tribulation when we have a global leader rise to power who is going to have a vested interest in not letting people find out what the Bible says about him. So I consider that and I read this and it says, I will send a famine throughout the land, not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And then the next verse, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. And that can't be talking about now because you can find the word of the Lord anywhere. 
easily online, carrying around in your pocket um, the entirety of, of the Bible, translations, you know, concordances, um, interlinears, like the, all of these study resources that you can have in your in your phone, on your phone, in your pocket, uh, that's not going to be the case according to the scripture in, in the time of the tribulation. Zephaniah chapter 1, the, uh, verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warriors shout his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring such distress on all people that they will grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. Again, friends, this is why I plead with you every video to come to Christ while there's time, because it's going to be hard to do it once the rapture of the church happens. Not impossible, but certainly difficult. And what is awaiting in that time is is not something you want to live through or go through. And lastly here, as we're bringing her in for a landing in Micah chapter 7, verse 1 says, What misery is mine? I'm like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the early figs that I crave. And see see my, my video on the fig tree generation for explanation about the early figs versus the late figs and what those mean. And that I, I think that'll bless you. I, I really do. Um, the faithful have been swept from the land. Not one upright person remains. Everyone lies in wait to shed blood. They hunt each other with nets. But like, look at this verse two. The faithful have been swept from the land. Not one upright person remains. That's an, that's a, an Old Testament reference to the rapture, I believe. Um, that's, that's the only time that no upright person remains. So again, Circling back around, we've, we've clearly indicated, I believe, and demonstrated a tie between the sun and the moon being darkened and the, and the moon, in, in some cases, turning red, turning to blood. And is that, and why that's a big deal? It's connected with the judgment of God. Now, does that mean that I think that um, that starts on Friday? No, uh, I don't rule it out as a possibility either, however, I'm not saying that's what this is, but I am saying that it makes this one the longest duration of a blood moon this century, essentially three and a half hours. That should ring your bells for the three and a half years of the first part of the tribulation. Um, and, and it's like, you know, it's not only the last, it's, it's not only the longest duration for the rest of the century. It's like the longest in the last 1200 years. So, it's, is it significant? Yes, because I believe Genesis 1.14, um, when it says, God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs. Let them be signs to mark uh, the seasons and days and years. And again, we, we look at that and, and break that down and, and we get, uh, we have signs and I think they're clearly signs and that uh, the words for sign is uh, Strong's 2.26 uh, in Hebrew, the Hebrew Strong's 226, which is oath, which means a sign. But it interesting, I thought, as you look at where this, uh, where the definition of this or, uh, lies in terms of the different ways this word can be used, it's all the way down here in number eight, um, where it says tie, signs or tokens of changes of weather and times. So, and that's how it's used in Genesis 1.14. So the, the sun and the moon and the stars are not given primarily just for light. They're given for signs and for seasons. And that, that seasons is um, the word moed. It's Strong's Hebrew 41.50. And again, that, that can mean two things. Um, there's uh, moed, which we're, we get moedim, which we know is the, the, the Lord's feast days. So, that's how it's, for me, that's kind of how I generally interpret that. However, that is kind of the 
um, the particular meaning of the word. How it's used, um, however, is, uh, is, let's see, I believe it's in here. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, uh, in Genesis 1.14, it is referenced to specific or sacred seasons coinciding with the moon's appearance, etc. cetera. Um, however, it also can have a general meaning, like meaning uh, an appointed time, but not necessarily a feast day. So I think it could apply either way to, as a symbol to the rapture. And, you know, we know that here recently, um, many people know this at least, there is a rabbi who's come out, a uh, prominent rabbi in Israel who's warning uh, President Biden that the blood moon, the longest blood moon of the century, is a warning, a divine warning against dividing Jerusalem. And I just want to pick up on this, um, what they believe about what uh, the blood moon. Uh, it says, um, let's see. So, anyway, I, I want to read that and I want to read it, it, something else after that. So, uh, okay. Well, where is the thing of what the, from the, what the rabbi said? Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Uh, and of course, now my, what in the world? Here we go. Computer is wonking out on me here real quick, so sorry about that. Um, so, again. It says here, Rabbi Mordecai Ganuth discussed the meaning of eclipses in Jewish tradition. Rabbi Ganuth explained that under normal circumstances, lunar eclipses are considered a bad omen for Israel. This is based on a section in the Talmud, Sukkot 29a, that specifies that lunar eclipses are a bad omen for Israel since Israel is spiritually represented by the moon. If the lunar eclipse takes place, in the east side of the heavens, then it is a bad omen for all the nations in the east. And similarly, if the if it occurs in the western hemisphere of the sky, it is a bad sign for all the nations in the west. Rabbi Ganuth says the eclipse will pass over the United States. And then he talks goes on to talk about how that's a warning to, to America. So pretty interesting from, from that from that standpoint. Um, I also find it interesting that it says a lunar eclipse, it says this case, the Earth's shadow will block out 97% of the moon's surface. Um, and so really in terms of like pictures and analogies and things like that, you, you've got like a remnant of the moon that is not affected by the, the moon turning blood. There's a remnant that won't be um, impacted, a very small segment. So you can draw your own conclusions on that, but I find that that part really interesting. And then the last thing I want to talk about um, is we we looked at all of the the places in Scripture where it it doesn't say that the moon turns to blood, but it just says that the moon is darkened. Remember? So I found this interesting in a different article out of uh, from Israel three sixty five news. It says the eclipse, being the one that's happening Friday will Thursday night and Friday, through Friday. The eclipse will coincide with the full moon. The November full moon is called the full frost moon, sometimes called a full beaver or dark moon. That was kind of a, a little mini mic drop moment for me when I read that. I was like, wow, okay. So we're, we're making some connections here. Again, I, I, don't, I don't know that that means that anything significant is going to happen, but I think it certainly bears watching, and I think it certainly could be an, an indicator of of something happening, or us moving into kind of a, the next the next step along uh, the prophetic timeline. And maybe it comes and goes, and there's nothing. But I think it's because of all the things that I've talked about, all the connections to judgment, the fact that it's the longest uh, of the century, the fact that it's three and a half hours, um, all of these things to me start to go, okay, it's, it's, it's certainly significant enough to watch. And I don't know that, again, I don't know what it all means, but if you're watching for the return of Christ, I think it's significant enough to watch. And my friends, all of these things, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, this should tell you that if you don't know Jesus, it's time to stop putting it off. Um, it, judgment upon the earth is coming. Now, is it happening next week. 
I don't know. Is it happening in a year? I don't know. Is it happening in two years or beyond? I don't know, but I'm, that's like, that's a slimmer possibility for me. And see my last video for reasons why. Um, I think we're in, I think we're in a very narrow window of time for these things to take place and our understanding and interpretation of these prophecies to, to be on point or not. But you look at the world, it is getting dark and prophecy is being fulfilled at such a pace that it is nearly, ask anyone that follows it, uh, ask anyone, any of the watchmen, I, I guarantee you they'll tell you the same thing. It's hard to keep up because so much is unfolding that we see in the pages of scripture as being foretold and prophesied would happen and be happening at near the time of the end. So don't put it off another day, my friends. Place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as the one who paid the price for your sins. Believe on him today and be saved. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you guys. And I really appreciate you guys. The last video, the responses were really great and just tons of encouragement and affirmation. And as I mentioned before, I, I really do these for, for two reasons. I do them for an audience of one. Um, I, I really just seek to do what the Lord wants me to do here. Um, and then I, I desire just that others would come to Christ. But I, your encouragement and affirmation, it does, it does mean a lot. And I appreciate your prayers. I covet those, as I said before. And I pray for you guys. I pray for your family members. Let's just pray for opportunities to get the gospel in front of just one person, just one person that needs to hear it. I love you guys, and I'll talk to you next time. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs> weekend. Uh, have a good week. It's Monday, Todd. <laughs> All right, bye. Bye.